All right, good morning, church. Take off my mask. I'm getting so tired of masks. I don't know about you. But we keep doing them because that's what keeps us healthy out there and moving in the right direction. We are moving in the right direction. You know, we were just talking, I was talking with Brian a little bit this morning. You know, uh, there's a really sad statistic that over 50% of the smaller churches in the United States have closed, never to reopen again. Some because they're not interested and some because uh, they can't afford to do what they do. And I'm just really grateful that uh, we've been able to keep the doors open. We have the seats available and those that are seeking the word of God are going to be able to join us. Amen. All right. So uh, welcome Easter morning. Right. Uh, a very uh, interesting conversation. Most of you know that I, I coach volleyball quite often. Uh, and I deal with uh, children between the ages of probably 12 and 18, give or take. And I'm with quite a few of them a lot. And this week I happen to be on the bus with several of them. And I, you know, as I do on bus rides, we try to have some sort of intelligent conversation. Um, and uh, we talked about it was going to be Easter this week. And what was that? And, you know, what did it mean? And where were you going? And who are you going to share that with? And so on. And um, the conversation came around, well, well, well why, did, why Jesus? Why did he die? Who was he? Why was he here? Why didn't God just do this all on his own? Why did he need to go through this? Blah, 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 and on and on, until finally someone yells out, did you know Helen Keller could fly a plane? And I was like, okay, but that's their brain, right? They're all over the place. Uh, but we were able to have some interesting conversation, and so I thought I would bring it to Easter because it's very appropriate. Why Jesus? Right. We're going to open this morning in Hebrews 9, and that's where we're going to spend our time if you have your Bible. Hebrews 9, verse 27, it says, Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to, to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Father, we thank you for the words that you provided us. We thank you that you've not left us here as orphans, that your son has conquered death, conquered sin, and is promising to come back and retrieve us, and it's in Jesus' name, amen. There's a whole lot going on in this one basic passage. Just as people are destined to die once and after that have to face judgment, Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. And my lesson today actually was going to be on the second coming part because today we're always celebrating the fact that he rose again, which is a really great thing. But without him returning, we are still unfinished. We're unfinished. We are incomplete works. We are waiting for salvation to come back. But that's not today. I was uh, prompted to go in a different direction, so that's where we're going. Hebrews 9, verse 1. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up, and in the first room where the lamp stand, uh, were the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. And behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered ark of the covenant. This ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these details now. I mean, this is really the opening conversation that Paul begins to talk about in the book of Hebrews. And he goes on and he says, look, we created this huge tabernacle. The Jews, the Jewish nation created this huge tabernacle based on God's instructions. And inside that tabernacle was the holies of holies. But why did we have to do that? Why, why was that set up? In which, way, in, in which way would God want that to be taken place? Today we get the opportunity to talk to God directly. We get to come here and worship freely. But then it wasn't so. So let's go back to the beginning and we'll figure it out. Genesis 2, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree uh, of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Well, so basically, it all comes down to sin. Because of the sin that took place in the garden, the garden, God had to be separated from man. And so he asked them to create a tabernacle. And he gave them some area they could go, and then only the Holy of Holies were to be uh, entered by the priest. And only after a blood sacrifice was taken place, because man failed in the garden. Now, I look at this and I go, God, did you have children before this? Because I know if I tell my children, you can have everything you want, but don't touch that. The first thing they want to do is touch that thing. And so that's what happened with his children, the first children that he created in the garden. Perfect, blameless, holy. So Eve went off and grabbed the apple and then gave it to Adam. And we picked that up in, verse, uh, in chapter 3. It says, Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate it. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So essentially, from the beginning of time, God created a plan to bring us back into worship with him the way he originally established it. Remember, God walked with Adam in the garden, it says. And he wants to have that type of relationship with us, but because of sin, we are separated from God. And he had to come up with a plan. Let's continue on in verse 6, back in Hebrews. It says, when everything had been arranged like this, the tabernacle, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. So blood, blood is the life-giving force that we all possess. It is life. And when blood is shed, that means there is what? Death. And it says that the priest once a year would enter the Holy of Holies, but not without blood. Well, when did blood enter? the whole situation. When did, when did man know that we had to use blood to do this? Well, most of us would think about maybe Passover, right? Remember the Passover story when God said to Moses, basically, hey, I'm going to come into Egypt and I'm going to pass over and you're going to sacrifice a lamb or a goat and cover your door. And if you do, I'll pass over you. And if you don't, I'll kill you. It's kind of Jay's version of it. But basically, that's how it worked, right? But it's way, way earlier than that. It's way back in the beginning. In Genesis 3, in verse 6, it says, When the woman, and I went on, she took some and ate it, the apple. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, man and woman, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves, right? They went out and grabbed the plants and made coverings for themselves. But it goes on to say, after God found them and saw them, in verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and and his wife and clothed them. So Adam and Eve realized they were naked and assumed that is sin, being naked, right? And so they clothed themselves. And that wasn't good enough for God. And so God had to sacrifice an animal to take its skin to clothe them again. And that is where the blood comes from. That's the first example of the blood sacrifice done by our God. God sacrificed an animal to cover the sin of Adam and Eve. Moving on, verse 9 in Hebrews 9. I know I'm jumping back and forth, so if your fingers are going, don't worry about it. This is an illustration for the present time, talking about what was going on with the priests in the tabernacle, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. So what, what he's saying here is that basically in the beginning, we did what we could in an earthly environment to cover our sin, which was temporary. It was very short-lived. And he goes on and says, 
verse 11, but when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, meaning the world, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. So what he's saying here is that Christ, through his own blood, was able to enter not the earthly tabernacle, but heaven itself, where God resides on the throne. Through his blood, and his blood alone is the only way to get to God. Sacrifices today, earthly sacrifices, were needed and necessary for the time before Christ, but are no longer needed or even worthy now since Christ has come and sacrificed himself. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant, right? So God made a first covenant with Moses and the Jewish nation. He created the Ten Commandments, the stones, and that type of thing. And then he went on and he gave them all kinds of rules. And if you want to spend your time following up on that, you can read the, the book of Leviticus. Okay, there are guilt offerings and grain offerings and fellowship offerings and sin offerings and guilt offerings and on and on and on offerings. And they give very specific ways how you are to deal with each of them. And if you didn't do it exactly the way it was written, they were not accepted. Well, Jesus doesn't need any of that. Jesus was the perfect offering, the one-time offering. Back in Hebrews, verse 16. In the case of a will or a covenant or a testimony, your Bible may say any number of those things. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it because the will is in force only when somebody has died, meaning that the testament of Jesus, the covenant of Jesus could only be proved once he, he died, once his blood was actually shed. So that was the answer, well, why did he have to die? Well, because if he didn't die, his covenant that he's made with each and every one of us, the promise of remission of sin, could not take place. Because a will is in force only when somebody has died, it never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves, together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all, and all the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. Oops, sorry, 21. In the same way, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Did you get that? So when they ask you, well, why didn't God just, why didn't God just take care of it himself? Well, because God is a holy God and righteous God, and he has a plan, and he has to follow the plan no matter what. And then in this, in this particular case, blood had to be shed. But it had to be perfect blood, holy blood. It couldn't be just earthly blood. We've been doing that, and it didn't work. It hasn't resolved our sin, and without it, there is no forgiveness. Verse 23, it was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Meaning, what we've been doing, what, what the Jewish nation was doing was a copy of of the sacrifices, a copy of a heavenly sacrifice where Jesus comes and fulfills it completely. He's the actual sacrifice. So it was a foretelling all the way back there, all the way back there, that this was what was going to, hap to happen for mankind to have remission of sin and be able to have a relationship with God. And we can see that. I alluded to that in Exodus 12. We talked about, you know, uh, Passover. It says in verse 3, Tell the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. 
verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old, verse 7. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorsteps, uh, sorry, doorposts, and the lintel of the house in which they eat it. Verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Verse 13. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. There's a lot going on here, but the idea is without the blood, they were not covered. Without the blood of Jesus Christ, you are not covered. And there's a piece here I want to just highlight a little bit, and I'm going to do some teaching on this down the road. But think of it this way. Moses came and said to the congregation, hey, if you want to be protected tonight, you got to go grab a lamb, you got to sacrifice this lamb, and then you got to paint on your door the blood of the lamb. If you do that, you're saved. If you don't do that, you're not saved. Let me put it in modern vernacular. For those of you that are not chosen Christ as your Lord and Savior, hey, Jesus Christ came and died for your sins. But if you don't choose him as your Lord and Savior and believe what he says is true, you are not going to be protected when he comes back the second time. Did you get that idea? Because we have so many people that are like, well, I don't have to do anything. God just loves me. I never have. To. No, that's not true. You are a very important part of the equation. If you don't make the decision, if you don't do something, uh-oh, he said do works. No, 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 not really works. Make a decision, then you aren't going to be saved, regardless of the fact that he, God so loved the world that he gave his only son to save it. Do you get the idea? And what did it say? And many will be saved, right? Many, not all. Why? Because not all will choose to do that. And I will guarantee you, not all of Israel decided to paint their posts. And some of them did not survive when God passed over. Get the idea? You have a choice. I'm trying to give you the information to make an intelligent choice. But you have a responsibility to choose Jesus. Different teaching. Continuing on, verse 24. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. So, again, he's highlighting. The tabernacle that was built on the earth was kind of to give you a representation of heaven. The Holy of Holies was only to be entered through the blood. And basically, you were only going to do it once. And a matter of fact, you know, uh, tradition says they would tie a bell and a line to the guy in case he went in there and dropped dead because he was in front of God. Right? He was in front of the the Holy of Holies are inside, and so they would drag him out. Um, Jesus just walked right into the throne room, and now he sits at the right hand of God because of the blood that he shed for each and every one of us. 25. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest entered the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again. The sacrifice was once, one time. No multiple sacrifices. Jesus did it the one and only time required. Otherwise, Christ would have to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the, uh, at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Once. He only had to come once and die for you once in order to cover you. One time. Not multiple times. Not over and over again. That's why the sacrifices on the earth made no sense. They were human understanding. Jesus only has to do this once. Verse 27. And just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to, bear, to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. And we're back at the beginning. All people are destined to die once. So those of you that have heard about, well, I'm going to get reincarnated. I'm going to get to come back again and again until I get it right. Eh, no. Once. You die once. You live your life and you die once. And when you die, you're going to stand and face judgment based on your life. Based on your life. Brian kind of touched on that a little bit on his breaking of bread. We're not worthy 
I was talking to another individual that wants to do something, and, you know, well, I don't feel worthy, but I feel called. Yeah, none of us are worthy. I'm not worthy to do what I'm doing here. None of us are. No, not one. But because of the blood of Christ, I am being perfected in the eyes of God. The sacrifice has been made for me, which makes me worthy. I can live my life in such a manner that I'm still worthy to God even when I am falling into sin. I am still worthy to God. He still loves me even when I mess up because his son has protected me. Do you get that? That should give us a lot of luxury in our life. And I'm not talking about, as Paul says, don't go on sinning. That's not the job. We're not going to continue to do that. But the reality is don't continue to put shame and don't, you know, all of these guilt and ill will and feelings on your shoulders that you're trying to carry around because you're not worthy. Guess what? You weren't born worthy. Get over it. But Jesus makes us worthy. Amen? That should bring us joy every day. <laughs> you know, I get a sign. I'm not worthy, but Jesus makes me worthy, so I have joy. It should be easy for us. Why are we walking in doldrums? There's nothing this world is going to do to bring us down. Ultimately, we all get to go to heaven. That's why we're celebrating Easter. He destroyed death. He conquered death. He proved what he said. I will raise you again. Don't worry about whether you're worthy. I'm worthy. And I promise that I will raise you again. But I want to hit it. I want to go back to this again. The, 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 the English doesn't mask this. Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. Highlight that in your Bible. Many. That is not an English translation issue. The Greek is polis, and it means many, some, most, but not all. He didn't sacrifice himself to take away the sins of all. He wants to take away the sins of all, but in order for your sin to be taken away, you have to what? Choose him as your savior. You have to choose him as your savior or your sin is not going to be taken away. You can't live a good enough life. You can't act a certain way. There's no formula in human intellect that will allow you to get to heaven other than choosing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, accepting that he came and died for you because you were unworthy. And because he died for you, you are now worthy. You are worthy of the mercy that God has blessed you with. There's too many people out there that don't get that message. And he's going to come a second time. Guys, it's awesome that he was raised from the dead, but man, we're waiting on him coming back. Because when he comes back, that's when salvation is really with us. When he comes back. Paul says in his scriptures that, you know, uh, at the end, the first that went to sleep in Christ or died in Christ, depending upon what your translation, will rise. Those that went and died first will rise. They slept, it will rise. Well, we're waiting for this coming back. We're waiting for this coming back. And that's why we break bread. That's why he says, do this in remembrance of me. Do this so I, I'm not leaving you as orphans. I'm coming back to get you. It's an important part of our understanding as a Christian. Yes, amen, he was born. Yes, amen, he died for our sins. Yes, amen, that he rose again. But amen, he is coming back. It's an important part of our walk. It's an important part of our message. He's coming back. Live in such a manner that you know he's coming back. Sharing the gospel is not difficult. And most of us will be going back home today. Um, and if you're like our household, I'll be going back home to a house full of people who didn't go to church today who don't have a relationship with Jesus, who have not spent a lot of time with him. Maybe they've had it in the past, but are not walking with him at the moment. And I have a responsibility to share with him the gospel of Christ. Not just turn on the TV and try to figure out if there's a basketball game or just talk about nonsense in the world and Biden and all that other. Not, that's not, that'll probably come up in our conversation, but our responsibility is to share the message of Christ. And it's a simple message. John 11, verse 25. This is all they got to do. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me 
will never die. Do you believe this? That's the gospel message right there and then. There's no jump through hoops, dress a certain way, repent of this, get rid of that, don't do this, don't do that. None of that nonsense is there. It's really a simple message. Because why? We're all unworthy. We're all unworthy. And he says, listen, just believe in me. If you believe in me because I am worthy, you're going to be saved. Believe in me because I am worthy. Live your life believing in me. What a simple message. The gospel message isn't difficult. I think we just get confused because of the world. So, my hope for you today is that you'll take this information with some new ideas on how to explain this to those that you're going to walk with. Today of all days, everybody knows what Easter is. Everybody understands why you know, that he at least died and he rose. They may not know why he did it. They may not know the value of it, but they got that concept down. You could build that into your conversations, and I would really encourage you to do that today as you walk with those. If you don't help the world see this when he returns, they don't get salvation. They get punishment and judgment. We've had a lot of death going around, right? You can't get out of it. You're all going to die. You're all going to end up in front of God as a judge. He's going to open the book of life for some of us. And the other ones, he's going to open a book that says, you're not covered by my son. But I did this, this, and this, and this, and this. Yeah, we don't know you. Sorry. Get it? We have a job to do. And I think sometimes we're just happy saving ourselves. I know I fall into that camp a lot. But we have a job to share that with the rest of the world. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for the message that you gave us this morning. We thank you for your son. We thank you that he was perfect, blameless, holy, that he was able to be the perfect sacrifice once and for all for all of us that choose him to be our Lord and Savior. We thank you for the mercy that you showed the world, and we ask that you make us ambassadors of that mercy and that we're bold that we share that message with those that need a savior and it's in jesus name amen i'm going to invite the uh, worship team back up we're going to close with a song this morning we appreciate you all being here and we hope that you uh enjoy the rest of your day